very excited to introduce Dr. James Lee this morning. Uh, he, will be, he will be talking about the previous work he did on visual processing and memory formation, specifically on how we process human faces. And his talk is titled Neuron Selective for Face Recognition in the Human Brain. If we can go to the next. He received his bachelor's in the University of California in San Diego. Then he uh, did his, he went to medical school in UCLA. And in UCLA and Cedar Sinai, Sinai, he learned about human electrophysiology. And then he came to Mayo Clinic and he's now a PUI3 uh, in neurosurgery with us. He has a lot of experience in functional neurosurgery and a lot of interest as well. And these are some of his selected publications. And if we go to the next one, we can see that um, a lot of his papers have been published in epilepsy uh, and in other very important neurosurgical journals. And these are only selected publications and very important contributions to the literature. Um, welcome, James, and we're looking forward to your talk. Thank you, James. And I, as you're getting your talk ready, I'm going to ask Sanjit because I know that Sanjit has been working with you as your mentor. Sanjit, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this talk. I think James has been doing a lot of interesting work. This is some of the work he was doing at UCLA uh, prior to starting residency. And uh, we're going to see how he's going to translate it during his time here. And I uh, look forward to hearing it and having some questions at the end. OK, can you hear me? Yes, right. perfect, James. You look great. You hit it in a night. There you go. Perfect. I yeah. mean, it's not a picture of you with your title. I just did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So this year, you know, one of the projects that I'm looking at is an extension of my prior single neuron work involving visual recognition memory. So our ability to recognize and familiarize a person's face is a crucial part of our human experience. Um, for example, when we meet a friend, our brains tap into both our conscious and subconscious to remember their facial features, emotional expressions, and form eventful memories. And this ability to form meaningful social interactions with our family and friends define one of our most important aspects of our lives. So let me give you an example here. Um, I give you two pictures here, and one of them is me and another is a famous Korean actor. And uh, can you tell which one I am? It may be uh, difficult, objectively speaking. Both of these pictures have two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. So our brain has a capability to recognize each of these details and put the images together in a unique way so that we're able to recognize and differentiate between people. So the left is me, and uh, I might get a lot of backlash from the Korean community for saying this, but we may still look a little similar here, I think. Um, with this next photo, you can see a clearer difference. So this example that I'm showing you suggests that our brain seems to utilize a variety of distinct circuits to do this in addition to knowing facial features. So we use color, background and context and emotion, et cetera. So what do we know so far about how we process human faces? So the framework for visual processing has been hypothesized in the early nineties by Milner and Goodale. And the two stream hypothesis, can you see my arrow here? The two stream hypothesis uh, is, um, describes the dorsal and ventral pathway uh, starting from the primary visual cortex. So the ventral stream has been thought to propagate the primary visual signals to the temporal areas in the limbic system to process what you're seeing. While the dorsal stream up here, um, it processes where you are seeing something in space. And much Pro progress has been going into visual processing has been made and um, it continues to show that this is sort of an incomplete view. And specifically in the ventral stream, uh, the facial recognition is thought to involve a core face network and an extended network. So the core network involves the occipital face area, posterior superior temporal lobe and the fusiform face area. And the extended network represents all of the region systems for higher cognitive processes, such as you know, biographical information and memory. Um, and these reg regions include the anterior temporal lobe, inferior frontal gyrus, the orbital frontal cortex, and the amygdala. I'll show you a study later uh, by Stanford, what happens when this FFA or some of the central core uh, face network is disrupted. 
And this uh, same paper, you know, studies developmental prosopagnosia, which is face, face blindness uh, using fMRI. And they do find that the right-sided OFA and FFA seems to be the center of dysfunction. And this most strongly correlates with facial recognition and dysfunction. And this lateralization of function has sparked an idea that perhaps, you know, using our existing data set, we can explore some of these uh, neural signals for, that are selected for faces. And in my last presentation here at Mayo, uh, we published a paper showing single neuron correlates of memory in the amygdala and the hippocampus. And we showed that in patients with the right-sided seizure onset zone in the MTL or medial temporal lobe displayed memory deficits. And we were able to correlate this uh, with individual neurons and their tuning to memory. So basically the key here is that only memory selective neurons were affected without having an effect on nearby neurons that process visual stimuli. So given this, can we see face selective neurons and are they disrupted in a very specific manner? And what does the literature say about facial recognition and laterality perhaps? So Hosokawa uh, and colleagues re recently uh, published that indeed patients with the MTL seizures do show facial processing deficits compared to control. And their memory test uh, showed deficits in patients who underwent the right-sided anterior temporal lobectomy, whereas the left side was not significant compared to control. And they additionally showed that both the left and right side are dysfunctional when this memory test that they did, uh, when they altered this in a way that it tests uh, working memory load. So when the subjects see facial features with less hints and, and the faces in 3D space, they seem to affect the both uh, left and right lobectomy groups. So this is basically saying that visual spatial working memory is involved in both left and right anterior temporal lobes. And uh, something interesting to mention about this paper it, uh, is that patients who undergo right temporal lobectomy, they don't seem to be aware of their deficits. Like they, they couldn't recognize faces clearly through these behavioral um, tests that they do, but in, um, they don't actually experience that or tell you the physician of uh, what, if they're experiencing these symptoms. And another uh, recent paper also looked at facial recognition and um, anterior temporal lobectomies and correlated this with the fMRI study. Uh, patients who underwent a right-sided anterior temporal lobectomy showed reduced activation of the right fusiform and lingual gyrus compared to the left. And they again confirmed that these right temporal lobectomy patients fared far worse in like facial identity recognition. And it, in addition to that, they did find that right-sided resection also showed some slight uh, impairments to emotional recognition. So when they show a picture of a face uh, with a sad face, they were less able to recognize that emotion. Um, so Parvizi lab at Stanford, they looked at 10 human subjects using ECOG and stimulation uh, and compared the left versus right fusiform gyrus in 10 human subjects. And I modified their figure to kind of go over what they found in the paper. Um, the patients who underwent a left-sided fusiform gyrus stimulation, the patients only reported phosphine. So this, this is like kind of like seeing lights and floaters, but the ability to recognize the face, that remained intact. And with patients who were stimulated in the right fusiform gyrus, there were interesting perceptions reported by the patients, such as uh, looking like a different person, the face metamorphing, and the person looking like a cat. So as you can see here, the uh, conscious perception of faces were disrupted, and it's just not simple visual floaters. Using the uh, prior data set that our lab has published uh, before, I'm currently looking at the single neuron responses when the subject views a picture of a face during a memory task. So basically we show the patients um, implanted with electrodes, 100 images to remember in the learning block. And after about 10 to 15 minutes, we show them another set of 100 images, 50 of which were shown in the learning trials and 50 were completely new to them. And a good proportion of these pictures that we show them uh, contained human faces. And from the amygdala and the hippocampus, I was able to find about 140 neurons selected for faces. And remember, this is about 60 patients or so. And we could, you know, these data sets are very rare and very hard to identify these single neurons. 
And this is some uh, preliminary data here. And I was hoping to get some input from anyone here, uh, no matter what sub subspecialty you're in, because any ideas are up in the air. And um, I think it's just requires some creativity. Uh, so I pulled all the activities of all face specific neurons in the amygdala and the hippocampus. And when the patients were in the learning phase, I'll show you the graph here in the bottom. So the X axis is in time in milliseconds and the Y axis represents the omega. So an omega is a, neuro, a single neuron strength of tuning to visual categories. So if the visual, if the omega value is high, that means the neuron has strong encoding to face stimuli. So at one second, an image is shown for exactly another second, one second here shown by the blue bars. And um, as you can see, the neurons in the epileptic zone are indicated in orange and the healthy zone is in blue. And they seem to behave uh, differently. If you're in the hippocampus here, for example, there, you don't see much difference. But when you see the neurons in the amygdala, there seems to be a, light, a wide distribution of uh, selectivity. And um, are these neurons in the epileptic zone of the amygdala responding to other categories in addition to phase? I'm still in the process of kind of thinking this through before I go into further analysis. And that after about 15 minutes later, after the learning phase, there's also a recognition phase. You see some variability here uh, when the picture of faces are shown. And again, in the hippocampus, not much difference. So my goal is to look at these uh, propagation of these core and extended networks of face processing signals and look at their tuning versus laterality. And I think there's a lot of uh, open avenues in terms of memory formation and I'm in the process of still analyzing this data. So in summary, you know, why is this important in neurosurgery? You know, we sometimes think of the right side as non-dominant, guide our surgical plans, counsel our patients on the risks and the side effects that they can expect or not expect. But the reality is that, you know, we don't really fully understand what effects the patients will experience. You know, even more so that we know sometimes the deficit itself cannot be realized by the patient. Uh, these cognitive effects are something we still don't understand and how to appropriately diagnose or treat. And we can't reliably measure how much it'll impact our social lives moving forward. So if I give you an example, you know, prosopagnosia, it has dire consequences in social life that can't be measured. You know, it's also associated with uh, severe psychiatric conditions like autism, depression, and anxiety. And I think by exploring these neural networks and like listening in on the rare patients that we have in their brain signals, we can learn more about the neuropsychiatric conditions, even more than one, and um, which circuitry is dysfunctional and how we can approach and treat these diseases through stimulation or lesioning. I really like to thank uh, Dr. Graywall, Dr. Blackmon, and Dr. Middlebrooks for their input. Uh, Rudis Hazard Lab for continuing to teach me how to do these uh, very specific analyses and the entire epilepsy team here at Mayo Clinic Florida. Thank you very much. Amazing, wonderful work, James. Great presentation. Sanjeev, you want to kick it off? Yeah, I, you know, I think this is really exciting work, James, and I'm glad you put it into context of why this is important for us. Um, but when you're looking at this, you're talking about the hippocampus and the amygdala. In terms of anatomically thinking about this, tell me what else you think is involved. So when we're looking at these serial EEGs uh, and we want to get intracranial monitoring, how do we really look at this as a network, not really as individual locations? Yeah, I, I think that's a I mean, that's a very good question. I wish I knew a little more about it, but you know, some of these um, networks they seem to overlap together. You know, the amygdala and the hippocampus is sort of connected. It it also has direct connections from subiculum or CA1 to the uh, central medial nucleus. Um, the networks that seem to be sort of uh, intertwined, we need to look at different uh, surface grids to kind of see the propagations between signals. And I think one of the key you know, uh, nodes that we can look at between these interconnections is the medial prefrontal cortex. And I think that's one area that I like to look at. Yeah, so one, one of the things you, you talked about was the dorsal stream versus the ventral stream. Mm -hmm. um, now, where do those actually interact with the hippocampus? Can you, can you subdivide the parahippocampus for us some? Uh, subdivide in terms of like the, um, uh, 
dentate gyrus and all of those cellular pathways or the parahippocampus not the hippocampus oh the parahippocampus um there hasn't been much study in terms of stimulation and uh or during that in that area to my knowledge that i looked at um i'll, I'll be sure to look at the parahippocampus yeah so you know we're, we're basically I think to put it into context, we're trying to compare visual working memory, right? Which is what we're doing constantly yeah. with visual long-term associated memory, right? Which is yeah. how you're encoding this. So, so mm -hmm. a lot of that work goes on in the parahippocampal gyrus. So when you're looking at the perirhinal cortex, the entorhinal cortex, the parahippocampal cortex, the thing I is think oftentimes we don't have sampling of those areas because we don't necessarily think those areas are involved in epilepsy but over the past probably five years with Siri EEG we are sampling those areas so I think that's an area that's ripe for us to look at because right now the data that we have is based off of functional imaging studies right of how they're involved in visual processing but we can look at actual single neuron studies in, in these sub areas of the parahippocampal gyrus. Uh, it would be really great if uh, Dr. Blackman's available or Dr. Tatum and the epilepsy team to talk about this. So, uh, uh, Jim, uh, James, that was a nice talk. Uh, so in terms of, I guess, uh, the practical aspect of your talk, how do you envision, let's say, you know, now with the emergence of these more minimal surgeries like laser, you know, your study, do you think in the future may, you know, allow us actually how we could spare, you know, patients from, you know, sustaining, you know, uh, deficit in terms of face recognition after their surgeries? Yeah, um, from the, uh, we have a very good brain tumor uh, uh, sort of team here. And, um, you know, in, in terms of like kind of sparing these white fiber matter tracks and kind of going around what we know of, about these important tracks, we try to minimize uh, disrupting them uh, during surgery. And I think, you know, my stu or studies moving forward, kind of studying all of these networks and where they travel in addition to neuroanatomy and imaging studies, perhaps you can identify some of these uh, tracks that are very important and try to uh, minimize disrupting these areas. But in terms of like future studies, I think there's another, uh, I think there's a study going on. I, you can correct me. If I'm wrong, Dr. Graywall, but um, you're looking at how much of these um, laser ablations correlate with uh, control of seizures uh, compared to like how much you ablate in certain areas versus which areas you cover and things like that. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's two different things here, uh, Dr. Faisa. Uh, you bring up a good point. I was just texting Dr. Blackman about this, but her and Dr. Sapsovitz have, have looked at, you know, hundreds of right anterior temporal lobectomies and post-op neuropsych testing to see if we can see this uh, data that's been replicated in other studies about right-sided anterior temporal lobectomy. But what's interesting is, do you think this is truly fusiform gyrus or is it parahippocampal and hippocampus, right? Because in laser ablation, we're still gonna take the parahippocampal gyrus as well as the hippocampus. So you're not really preserving those areas. But if we think this is more occipital temporal or fusiform gyrus related deficits, then we might be. And we have enough patients that we can look at this. So this is something that we're gonna look back at retrospectively to see if there's, there's a difference and hopefully we can tease out that network a little bit better. And for the um, anterior temporal lobectomy studies, they do show a, a good, they show good data in terms of like how much of the resection was done. And I think, um, they they do mention that all of these like all of these uh, patients did get parahippocampal resections, but it's um, in terms of like their memory deficits and facial recognition. That's sort of uh, unclear. They can have like sort of weird results there, but for sure, fusiform gyrus on the right uh, seems to have an effect. Yeah, I think it's fascinating. I, I love the way that um, James talked about how little we know about these regions. And how do we make our surgeries better, our therapies better? How do we use the operating room to learn, you know, from these areas that then can allow us to do better for our patients and treat our patients, you know, whether it's surgical treatment or stereotactic radiosurgery or laser to try to understand these pathways, I think is very important. 
I go back and I know Sanjit had already invited, and I think that is probably in the launching pad, you know, Eddie Chang, who has been truly a, a champion, recently inducted to the National Academy of Medicine for his work in the temporal lobe. So he's been in one area, right? And now right here with the work that uh, James is proposing uh, with Sanjit, maybe it's another area of the brain in which we can use. And Eddie has been perfect because he's come from both the epilepsy and the oncology. And he's been able to get, use the patients to be able to record from the operating room, you know, uh, pairing up with the biomedical engineering department at UC Berkeley. But we can do similar things right here with you guys. And I wonder whether or not Sanjit would be worthwhile for James to go and spend a week or two, you know, visiting with Eddie and, and just absorbing what they're doing at UCSF, you know, which is be one of the leaders in this area. Something for you guys to consider as you guys are moving this. And of course, Kai and I are ready to use our patients with brain tumors to learn more because I think that whether it's depth electrodes, whether it's a circular grid and Anthony is thinking about all these things already, you know, and collecting then that tissue from the oncoepilepsy perspective, I think is going to potentially have very, very important contributions to our patients. I, I, I agree. And, and I think uh, James is going to spend some time with Eddie. It's going to be helpful. I was thinking more as a senior resident once he's done some of this work. Gotcha. Uh, but absolutely, I think him spending, similar to what I did when I went over to UCSF, it was very helpful once I had the basics down of what I needed to get done. Um, you know, I, I think similarly to what Eddie's done with speech, James wants to do with vision and visual memory. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think the ultimate goal here is when we're looking at neuroprostheses and looking at brain machine interface, we need to understand the basis of yes. how these signals are processed so that we can try to replicate them. So thinking of patients who have like cortical blindness, um, things like that, how are we going to be able to get them to recognize faces, get them to recognize objects? And that's where this data is going to be coming in handy. So, so if I, I could it. just jump in and add something here. James, a, a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, you know, I think one of the things with facial recognition is that in, in, in medicine, it really pales in comparison to security and law, where facial recognition is at a pinnacle of its use. You know, one of the opportunities I think that's going to unfold uh, as it is unfolding right now is the use of machine learning in terms of identifying some of these faces, uh, which is now being done in, in Alzheimer's disease with selectivity and specificity, which is kind of a surprise. But I, I would also uh, uh, echo what uh, uh, Dr. Graywall said about uh, an opportunity for looking at its translation into treatment. And one of the things to consider uh, are number one, with our stereo EG, you can exclude the sampling bias in the temporal lobe by using electrical stimulation to see if, if that might not have an effect in the fusiform, uh, in the um, uh, occipital region, uh, to see if that might not be a treatment at some point in the future as opposed to uh, recording. Another thing is I, I was happy to see that you had Karen involved in this too, because with your difference that you show between the amygdala and hippocampus, as Dr. Q pointed out, mood is super important in terms of what we see and how we interpret faces. So, you know, it's probably, um, uh, as you as you know, important to identify the mood aspect uh, as well as the cells that uh, encode for, for facial recognition. But beautiful talk. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Tatum. I, Thank I, you, Bill. I, I go ahead. Was that, was that Karen or? Yes, who, yes. Hi. Yes, perfect. Yes. <laughs> hi, I, I, um, I have complete confidence that Dr. Lee is going to help us understand some of the basis for autobiographical memory impairment in these patients as well, because Dr. Tatum, you may know that after anterior temporal lobectomy, it's true, patients will rarely report uh, prosopagnosia, a full-blown face blindness after an anterior temporal lobectomy. But what you get are examples like a patient who said he approached someone to ask her out and had forgotten that they had dated for a while. So there be some, you know, kind of dysfunction in face memory networks, and usually with an autobiographical component. 
So I think that this posterior to anterior gradient is what's so important with the more posterior regions, you know, that are less affected by anterior temporal lobectomies being more involved with perception of faces and integration of features, but the more anterior regions being involved in these complex autobiographical networks and memories of people, do they signal threat? Do they signal safety? And that's where the amygdala comes in to help route these specific faces and memories of people with action planning. What do we do? Do we avoid someone or approach someone? So I think Dr. Lee is going to really shed some light on this important dimension of human behavior with his research. I love it, Karen. This is, I, and I think that's what I told, uh, you know, James, that I thought it was important that he continue with this work. I mean, we're doing a lot of anterior temporal lobectomy, dominant, non-dominant hemisphere. The issue is, can we ask specific paradigms that can be done simultaneously as we're doing the surgery so that way no extra time is added to the case that is going to jeopardize either the outcome or anything like that. So things that we're already doing that we can extend record either single neuron recording or population recording, the circular grid obviously for us is, 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 is an opportunity. I mean, Dr. Tater and myself have spent a lot of time, Anthony is writing extensively about this, by way, can we go deeper? into trying to understand these regions. And as we're doing the lobectomy, because you guys are already doing a lot of tests on the patients. Can we know what is going on and how we may be giving patients deficits? Because I agree with Sanjeev, the future is gonna be in whether you have a stroke, whether you have trauma, can we put neuroprosthetics to recover this part of the, of the brain to be able to make it better? This is where we have opportunity to be innovative and creative. Or perhaps after I do the surgery, I create a deficit and that patient that needs facial recognition, work in a picture for be able to do cartoons or whatever, we can begin to recover, you know, or help them in recovery of function. You know, things like that are gonna be important. Dr. Lee, last words, wrap it up, bring it, bring it to conclusion. Yeah, I'm just very excited to uh, move forward with this and, you know, um, all of these neuropsych research and things like that is just open to air. Uh, we have tons of opportunities to do this here, and um, I'm very excited for it. Thank you. Beautiful. Well, we have over 90 participants from 11 different countries this morning. Brazil, Colombia, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, India, Italy, Mexico, Panama, Peru, Spain, and the United States. A lot of people that came in. This is a, a lot of tremendous interest. How do we use the operating room as an extension of the laboratory without compromising the care of the patient? I think that's a frontier. But I have no doubt between you, Dr. Blockman, Dr. Greenwald, Dr. Tatum, Dr. Feiza, our colleagues in biomedical engineers, the, the things that we're doing with wireless technology already. I know Diogo and I, we have a few patents that we put together with the Arizona State University for wireless technology for brain recovery and some grants that we have. This is where we can extend this application. So tremendous amount of work going on. So great. Well, thank you, everybody. We're looking forward Friday. We have our colleagues from Colombia. A lot of congratulations right there on the chat. You know, uh, as you can see uh, from a lot of people, they were very, very excited about this. And uh, thank you, Karen, Dr. Blackman, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Agrewal, for your extraordinary uh, input. And of course, Dr. Tatum and Dr. Fiesa, thank you for the division of uh, epilepsy for continuing to help us. And, and continue to push us beyond what we normally do in the operating room. We're very excited about our future. So, all right. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. Buen dia. Feliz semana. Gracias, Gabriel. Gracias. Mm -hmm. <laughs>